So we are looking at the Nicene Creed tonight. The Nicene Creed. Uh, when you think of the Nicene Creed, what you're really thinking of is the, or typically most people thinking of, uh, the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed, the, the, the creed that comes from Nicaea and Constantinople, two different councils. But it's just way too complicated to say it, so we just say Nicene Creed, fine. Or sometimes just the creed, the creed. There are other creeds out there that uh, you have probably heard of. There's the Apostles' Creed, which is popular in the Roman Catholic Church, used at baptisms, and is predates the Nicene Creed. It's an early Roman creed, and predates the Nicene Creed by some time. The um, Athanasian Creed, the Creed of St. Athanasius, or uh, Athanasius, as it's said in English, often. the Patriarch of Alexandria. It's an, another creed from Northern Africa. It's a little more complicated. But all Christians agree on and use, all apostolic Christians agree on what's called the Nicene Creed. You find this among all apostolic churches. All apostolic churches will agree. Even if they have another creed, say the Roman church that has the Apostles' Creed, they'll agree the Nicene Creed is... Uh, preeminence over their personal or their local apostles' creed, the creed of Rome. And that creed has authority in the apostolic churches because of its use from early patristic period. Uh, you'll find it showing up in the liturgy itself, in the Sunday service, by the time you get to about the 8th century. But it goes back to 3rd, 4th century. Scholars will debate the exact origins and relationships to the councils and things like that. But basically, we can summarize all of that in this way. The early church, as it developed and spread, began to encounter various heresies. And in order to preserve the purity of the gospel, those who were suggesting new ideas and things like that were excluded, excommunicated from the community. We can see this in Paul's epistles. He talks about this. In the epistles of John, he says, if someone doesn't come to you keep it, uh, speaking the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the gospel that was handed on to you, Christ was, was, came in the flesh, then don't let him in the house, he says. Don't let him in the house. That is in the church. Back then, churches were held in a house. So there was this, this attempt to exclude and keep out these false doctrines that were starting to arise that the Christians saw as, as something that would contaminate and therefore could compromise the proclamation of the gospel throughout the ages. One of the major moments in early church history where this takes place is what's called the Arian crisis. There were little heresies here and there before that, the Judaizers, the, the uh, dualists, and et cetera, et cetera, Marcionites. But Arius and his heresy spread throughout the church. And most scholars would agree that somewhere around this period is where we start to see the development of the concept of a creed, some sort of a creedal statement, some essential things that you can, you can say, this is it. And so what starts to happen, again, we kind of have to look, you know, rewind a bit and look between the lines and things like that, but most scholars would agree that somewhere before the Council of Nicaea, before the actual moment when the, cre when, the, when the council gathers to discuss the heresy of Arius and things, that there were already creeds starting to develop in different regions that were local attempts to keep out those who were coming up with false doctrines. And so the Apostles' Creed would be 
possibly one of these examples. A local creed there, in, in the case of the Church of Rome, predating the Council of Nicaea, that was used in that region to kind of keep things nice and clean and pure. Everybody's on the same page kind of thing. And then in other regions, as we suspect, there were probably other creeds developing around the same time. Eventually, when the Arian crisis gets to such a point that Constantine calls a council, because his, the empire is being torn apart by this heresy, right? at this point, the, the Christianity is the, is the common religion of almost everyone in the empire. There were pagans running around everywhere, of course, Jews and other things. But, but Christianity was the common religion. Every other person was a Christian at this point. So, so the, the empire starting to be torn apart by this, this heresy, this idea that Arius had proposed, that Jesus of Nazareth was not eternally divine. And so the council was called. Bishops came to the city of Nicaea, that city is still there in modern-day Turkey, so it's by a different name. And at the Council of Nicaea, the bishops who had gathered, over 300 of them, including Bishop St. Nicholas, later known as Santa Claus, gathered together and condemned the error of Arius. You may know the story of Nicholas, who, when he heard Arius, this priest, get up in the midst of all the people and say something like what he said, Nicholas, the bishop, was so offended by what he heard, he walked right up to him in the midst of the council and laid him out. Well, Christianity was one of the state religions at that point. You can't just lay out an official. <laughs> so Arius, though everyone agreed he was a heretic, Arius, you can't just punch a guy like that in the midst of a, a state council. They're having, it's the middle of court, right? Can you imagine this happening in a modern courtroom? Whether or not you agree with what's going on or not. So Nicholas was thrown into jail <laughs> that night, and he eventually was let out. And uh, anyway, jolly old St. Nicholas. There's the real St. Nicholas. All right, so now, uh, eventually, the council, the council condemned the error of Arius and proclaimed, rather, that Jesus of Nazareth was not, didn't become divine at a certain moment in time, but rather was eternally divine, was, it was, was God from God, light from light. That's what the council said, but of course it took a long time for this to work itself out. This is before fax machines and emails. So the heresy, Arianism, continues on for another century or two. And in fact, even today you find versions of Arianism floating around. Jehovah's Witnesses, a modern-day form of Arianism. Though not historic. Originally, they didn't hold the doctrines they have today, but modern watchtower doctrine is Arian. Okay, so that's the Council of Nicaea. You have a few more councils, Constantinople, Chalcedon, etc. Okay, we don't, want, we don't have to spend too much time tonight on just church history. It can take us a couple hours. But out of these early councils, we get this creed called the Nicene Creed or the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, longer form. So the Nicene Creed, which in the form we have it today, for the most part, basically comes out of these two councils, where you have the early form all the way up to the mention of the Holy Spirit. The night, that's the Nicene Creed in the early form. And then the Council of Constantinople adds the second part about the Holy Spirit, the maker of life, et cetera, et cetera. We'll look at this in the Creed in a second. And that has to do with the period of the time when, when there were questions regarding the Holy Spirit and and uh, his personhood and nature. So the first part of the creed, you'll notice as we're going to look at it, mentions the Father, the Creator, very quickly. 
there's no debate among Christians at the time that, that there was God the Father. Okay, everyone's okay on that one. Well, what about Jesus? So you get this long section describing the Son of God. And that's what was going on in the time of Nicaea when they were debating about the nature of Jesus of Nazareth. So yeah, this, the creed basically is intended to answer that question. And then the creed ends with the reference to the Holy Spirit, one line, and the Holy Spirit. We believe also in the Holy Spirit. And then that's the creed as it comes from Nicaea. But then later on, the Council of Constantinople, because then heresies and questions begin to arise regarding the Holy Spirit, then you have a whole paragraph on the Holy Spirit. And then we come to our modern form of the creed. Okay, so that's the creed, its development. Its earliest form, as far as we can discern, comes from low, different regions. The Roman creed or the Apostles' Creed is probably one of those relics of something like that, where you have this early creed form that was used as a way to distinguish between orthodoxy and heterodoxy. And as far as scholars can discern, its primary usage in a liturgical setting originally was during the baptismal service. During the baptismal service. And as far as we can discern, when they would dunk the guy three times is when they would recite the creed. Do you believe in the Father? I do. I believe in the Father. They recite the first part of the creed, and they dunk him. Okay, now we're going to check your next part of your orthodoxy. Do you believe in the Son? I believe in the Son. And then they would recite the next part of the creed. Everyone check out on that? You agree? Okay, dunk them. And then third time, what about the Holy Spirit? Come on. And then you just recite the section on the Holy Spirit, and then you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so it was used not only as a, a litmus test for orthodoxy, but especially that critical moment when someone's coming into the church, whether you're going to accept him in the church. All right, so that's the early form of the creed, the origins of it, the history. As far as we can discern, it comes out of the baptismal services of the early church, at least a few decades before the Council of Nicaea, various regional creeds that eventually coalesce, brought in the memory of the bishops who gathered at the council, what are you doing over, Nicholas, what are you doing in, in Myra? Oh, here's what we say when we dunk a guy three times. What, what do you, you see this, what do you, what do you do over in Caesarea? Ah, here's what we do, or whatever. You, they would add, you know, and they gathered together, and they, they created what we call the Nicene Creed. And then again, that later edition with Constantinople. It remains in that way as a kind of a, a litmus test for orthodoxy for the next few centuries and probably regionally continued to be used, either replacing local creeds or uh, maybe being uh, used in regions where they didn't, had yet not developed a creed. Until finally, when you get to about the 8th century or so, it starts to be adopted into the, into the Sunday Eucharistic services of the churches which is where most people encounter it today and, and, and associate with. Okay, so that's the history and usage. Today, most people, as I said, uh, know the creed from, they at least, when they, you say Nicene Creed, they think Sunday service. But don't forget, if you're at a baptism, that's when you're going to see it again. You're going to still see it there as that relic at a baptism the person being baptized recites it. Everyone else recites it with them. That's nice. But the person who's being baptized has to recite it. If it's a baby, then the adult, the, the, the sponsors recite it for them. And the community recites it with them as well. But there's that early usage still. This Sunday, we have a baptism at St. Elias. If you're nearby, you're going to see that. when We're going to baptize that baby and also a few adults possibly. And, uh, and we'll be using the creed right then. That's the moment that you can see that early usage. But... You'll see it also during the Divine Liturgy on Sunday, wherever you happen to be in the world, whatever apostolic church you're attending, you'll see it still used. 
And that's because of that later edition. And again, it's very helpful there at that point, eighth, ninth century uh, to, it, it's very, at that point, you know, it's catechetical. It's less of a let, litmus test at that point. It's more of a, just a catechetical device, as most of the texts of the liturgy are. Think of the beautiful hymn by Saint, uh, or Emperor Justinian, uh, O Only Begotten Son and Word of God. What a beautiful hymn. There's a, a beautiful catechetical statement, beautiful uh, surgical hymn that is, that is rich in catechesis. And the creed is like that. It's so rich, it becomes part of the liturgy for catechetical purposes. All right, so history, usage, and now... Um, and now let's take a look at the text. And I've got for you here, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, let me blow it up a little bit. Maybe I can blow it up a little bit more. Okay, everyone see that all right? You're saying, I don't read Greek. I know, it's okay, don't <laughs> worry. We're gonna take care of that right now. Okay, so I want you to see it. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at it in Greek and we're gonna, I'm gonna write it out for you in English as we go. Translations vary. Some of them really annoy me uh, because they don't really get the grasp, the depth of what's going on here in the Greek. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna translate as we go and uh, as we go section by section through this, okay? So first of all, what we're going to do is divide out from this uh, creed here in the Greek, the first paragraph, the first section. There are four major statements in the creed. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then a, uh, a fourth one about the church and baptism. So first one, and the, again, the English translations completely destroy the structure. But we're going to try to preserve that as we, as we go through this in translation. So first of all, let's look at this first line here in the Greek. Pistevo is enatheon. I believe in one God. I believe in one God. Pistevo is enatheon. Theon. You can hear the word theos there, right? I believe in one God. All right. Now, just a quick little note. In the earliest form of this creed, before the council, it probably was simply, I believe. But as we get it from the Council of Nicaea, it says, we believe. And so this is the first difference you'll notice among many uh, uses in English. In some places you'll hear, I believe. In other places you'll hear, we believe. And you'll have, at the coffee social, people you know, screaming and fighting over what's the more traditional thing. Well, okay, just settle down. All right, it's a little more complicated than that. I believe may have existed before the Council. In fact, it probably did. It was being used. If it was being used in a baptismal service, the person would have been asked, do you believe? And he said, he said, Pistevo is anatheon. Please dunk me. Right? And, and then it would dunk him. But when it comes to the creed in the council, these are the council fathers adopting these local creeds, creating a text that becomes a declaration of the council. And when you get the council's declarations, you're going to get it in the plural. We believe, we believe, as the bishops who have gathered together, we believe. Okay, so the actual text that comes in the council is we believe. But then as it gets adopted then into liturgical use later on, especially in the Sunday service in the 8th century, you start to see it, reverting back to, as far as we turn, what was probably the earlier baptismal usage, I believe. Because now it's becoming catechetical. It's the person I believe. Again, we believe, I believe, either one works. And again, uh, you'll find it in English, in both forms, different apostolic churches, not something that we need to worry too much about. Pistevo is enatheon, I believe in one God. So let me write that out. So I believe in one God, and I'll put the we in brackets there, uh, or parentheses, just regarding our uh, discussion in history. Okay, we believe in one God, patera pantocratora, in one God, Father, 
all powerful, almighty, all holding, literally in the Greek, literally all holding. Okay, so we'll just even do it literally for fun here. All holding, all grasping, right? He's all powerful, almighty. So we believe in one God. Father almighty, all holding. And then the next line there. Piete uranu case tes tes who made so maker of sky and land. Name I said, why'd you do that? I like heaven and earth. It's so much more churchy. I know. That's why I didn't do it that way. Okay? I want to make this bring this down to the earth. Right? Let's get this real. The maker of the sky and the land. When you think, when I say heaven and earth, you're probably thinking clouds and a big blue NASA, you know, ball in a NASA picture or something. All right, so let's bring this back to their period of the stuff above you and the stuff below you. Okay, this is what you get in the in Genesis one. God made the heavens and the earth. He made the sky and the land, and then they're going to start talking about the water. Right, the three realms of existence. Okay, maker of the sky and the land, maker of the stuff above and the stuff below. That's the point, okay? So sky meaning that which is above and land which means that which is below you, okay? Father? Yes. Um, uh, Ponto Crotter, is that the all holding? Yes. And can you just say a little bit more about, can you give a little bit more about another way of saying that? So almighty is the usual translation. Right. You could put all powerful if you want. It comes, this is all biblical, by the way. This is rich in biblical text. I believe in one God. So one God. I should put in all the scripture text for you here. This is Deuteronomy 6.4. Right? Shema uh, Israel Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad. Right? One God. This is the Shema prayer. One God. Paul quotes it in Romans Romans 3, right? One God. So we believe in one God, and it says that right off the bat, to make sure we're not talking about polytheism here, as it now is going to talk about the Trinity, which was one of the problems in the early church. Polytheists coming into the church could easily slip into a polytheistic understanding of the Trinity. And then Father, all holding, all holding or almighty, that comes from Revelation chapter 1. This is Revelation chapter 1. If you've got a Bible, you can look at this. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. See that word Almighty there? This is Genesis, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Almighty, which is your typical translation, Almighty which is fine, but almighty in English means all might, like all powerful, right? Which is fine, again, uh, but just I was trying to get the, the sense of their all holding, right? All grasping, control, all controlling. Again, all powerful, almighty gets you the sense oh, of it. Thank you. Okay, so that's Revelation 1.8. All right, uh, and then... Maker of, so let me bring this down now. Oops, let's see here. Let me find this one. There we go. Maker of heaven and earth. So, and then, but what do you mean heaven and earth by that? Well, let me tell you. Of the visible stuff, so uraton, so of what is visible. And also, all things invisible. Oraton, visible, and a oraton. Okay? All right. So he made it all. That's the obvious. So what are they trying to say? We believe in one God. Okay? That's clear. Now. Of the Father, we believe in the Father Almighty. So 
You could even put this, let me drop this down the way it's structured here. We believe in one God. That's it. No debate. And then the creed goes on to say, what do you mean by that? Well, let me tell you what I mean by that. The Father, almighty, maker of the heavens and the earth, the sky and the land, the stuff above, the stuff below, of what's visible and what's invisible. Everything. He made it all. Right? Now, why are they talking like that? You say, well, of course he did it all. What else? Who else would have done it? you got to put yourself back in that polytheistic world. There are a bunch of stinking pagans around them. Okay, so then, so we believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of the heaven and earth, visible and invisible, everything. And, and in one Lord. One Lord. Que is ena kirion. And in one Lord, Kirion Yesun Christon. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ. Ton Huion Tu Theon Ton Monogene. All right, so this is Ton Huion, the Son of. God, only the one who is only begotten. Let me get, I'll get the article to it as well. The the one who is only begotten. Monogene. Ton ectu patros. The one who. The one who. Who, from the Father. Genethenta was born. Was born. Begotten in English because they were born. That's from a lady, right? Begotten is from a man or something. But they, they don't care much about that Greek. So was born, right? Came from. Was born. Pro panton ton eonum. So he was born before. Pro is before. And if you don't see where we're at here in the Greek here, this is what we're looking at right now. Pro panton ton eonon. Before panton, before all, ton eonon. Before all ages. Before all ages uh, time, basically, would be modern English in a sense of it. Before everything. Before before the the his, before all history okay before history came to be all right and by the way stop me anywhere along here if you what's that let's look at that for a second okay all right all right so look at how the creed is is structured here so we believe in one god father almighty creator of heaven and earth of all, everything is visible and everything is invisible. Why does that have to say that? This is just like Genesis 1. Genesis talks about the world, the heavens, the earth, everything was made, even light, by one God. Right? Now, how did he make it? Oh, well, there's a little more details there. Right? The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. He said, let there be light, right? He used his word. So he's the origin, the creator of all things, but he created through his word and spirit, right? Through his breath and voice, right? Just like we do when we you speak. You can't speak without breathing, right? It comes out. So you know, the word and the spirit together, he creates through them, right? All right. Uh, and then, why does it say who was born before all ages? That's right there. That's hitting areas right in the eyes, square <laughs> right in the forehead, right? He was born before 
all ages. He came from the Father. Yes, he's become the Father. Yes, but he was before all ages. Right? Arius was saying there was a time when the Son of God was not. And the Creed is saying there was no time when the Son of God was not. All right. And then, Phos ek photos. Light from light. Now, look at the structure here. This is so beautiful in the Greek. It's one long sentence. <laughs> we believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of what is visible and invisible, and in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten Son, the one who from the beginning, uh, from the Father, was born before all ages. Light from light, true God. So this is phos ek photos, light from light, theon elethinon, true God, ek theu, true God from God. Uh, and the true God from, and then Elethinu. So there's true God from, true God. And then, Gene, this word doc keeps moving on me here. Genethenta u huyethenta. So who was born? Who was born, Genethenta, not Puyethenta, not made. Right? That's, that's again, anti Arius. Right? Genethenta, he was born, U Puyethenta, not made. Okay? And then, here's the, usually a a, 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 more of a famous part of this here. Omoousion. Omoousion. You probably know of this word. Omoousion. Right? Omoousios in the nominative form. Here's the accusative form because everything's, it's I believe in. And so this is all accusative. So, omoousion to patri. The same nature with the Father. So homo, homo, same, usion, or usios in the nominal form, being, existence, nature. Translations vary here because the philosophers and theologians, you know, they like to write lots of, lots of books about this. But basically what it's trying to say is identical, okay? One in being with, who was who was born, not made. Homo usion to patri. The, let's see, I'll keep going. Who was of the same uh, nature slash being with the father. Usually get in translations here, uh, essence or substance. That brings in other theological stuff as well, though. You, uh, substance is the Latin translation of the Greek, it's literal, of uh, hypostasis. Substance, hypo, under, stasis. So it just means being, existence. So of one existence, one nature, one being. All right. Now, remember, this is before the Council of, of Ephesus. They're going to have to start, you know, refining some of this language a little bit later on with, with Nestorius and things like that. All right. Genethenta upoyethenta, born, not made, of one who was of one essence with the Father. Again, we're, this is one sentence here. One sentence. It was one essence with the Father. Di uta panta agenito. That's right out of the Gospel of John. 
Uh, so light from light, true God from true God. That's basically there. I'll put another verse. Basically John 1. Uh, and who was born, not made, who was the same nature with the Father, and uh, and di utapanta. Here's the Greek here. Di so di dia through di u tapanta all things again it happened. So who through whom all things happened? Right? Through whom all things happened came to be came to an existence. Uh, let's see here. Slide the English side up here so we have room here. It's going to keep. It's going to get jumbled. All right. So get it. Where were we here? Through whom all things happened. This is down here. All right. And then through whom all things happened. Uh, and usually it's just translated came to be, okay, which is the range of that word uh, in, the, in, the, in the Greek. Literally just uh, happened, existed, came, we all sorts of different translations. Came to be. Came into existence. All right. And that, again, that's right out of John. That's almost a direct quote from the prologue John chapter 1. And then, ton di imas tu anthropus ke dia ten emeteran soterian. All right, so, who some room here. Who So again, we believe in, this is all one sentence here. So we believe in, uh, let me put it in, it, he whom, he whom, tondi uh, imas to santhropu, so whom, uh, let's see here. We, oh, what's in here? Don di imas tus antro, we men, and, and for our salvation came down. Okay, so for the sake of, we, dia can be through, but in this case with the accusative, it's for the sake of. All right, so who, for the sake of mankind, okay, so anthropos in Greek. Anthropos means human being, all right? I know there's a lot of English translation debates and, you know, and political arguments and things about that, but mostly by people who have never read Greek. All right, there are three words at play here. Anthropos means human being versus theos, God, okay? There's God, theos, and there's human being, anthropos. You know, the word anthropology, right? Study of mankind. And then there's the word man as in like an actual male version of this. That's aner. Aner from which andros, andrology. Uh, and then you, and then there's the word guine for woman. Aner, guine. You know the word guine, uh, gynecology. So, so there, the word for man, it, man meaning male one, is aner. The word meaning woman is guine. And then the word meaning a human being, that's anthropos. And the reason why it's become a big political thing is because people like stuff to stay churchy, meaning they like it the way it always was, which really means how they remember it from their childhood doesn't necessarily mean how it always was. Right? So for most people, tradition is 
what I remember as a child. So, um, so in our English translations, you'll find a lot of English translations today. Because we typically use the word man in modern English to mean the male one, and we don't usually use the word in modern English man anymore to mean mankind, human beings, typically. There's a lot of English debates about translation and how to deal with this in the, in the scriptures and in, the, and in our hymns and things like that. It, it doesn't always work, but if you can, it's nice to somehow try to bring out that subtlety in the Greek. So, uh, so in this case, and, and by the way, one of the worst ways to do this is say man and woman or men and women, because then what about the kids, right? Now you got a bigger problem, right? So uh, you'll see this sometimes in English translations for man, anthropos, you get men and women. You got a little five-year-old saying, what about me? Oh, no, you know, how do I fit in here? So mankind, humankind often is one of the better translations of this. But anyway, who for, who for the sake of mankind, tus anthropos, in the, again, this would be men in the plural, but meaning men and women, including the kids. And dia ten e meteran soterian, and for the sake of, and for the sake of our salvation. Now, what does salvation mean? Salvation, remember, means to be saved from death, okay? To be saved from death. In the Old Testament, you'll find the word salvation all over the place. You'll find the Savior in the Old Testament. Who is the Savior? The guy who saves you from the guy who's trying to kill you. Your enemy is the one trying to kill you, and your Savior is the one trying to help you and defend you and save you from death. Okay, it's all over the Old Testament, in the Hebrew and then also in the Greek. So, so the Savior, the Savior here, he came to, for the sake of all mankind, for the sake of mankind, and for the sake of our salvation. So he came for the sake of man to save them, if you want to put it into the English, right? More dynamic English way of saying it who for the sake of mankind and for the sake of our salvation came down from heaven. Or you could say, in order to save, for the sake of saving mankind, right? Save them from what? From death, right? From death. As you get older, that becomes a little more, you know, relevant, doesn't it? Right? So young theologians can sit there and talk, have you been saved? Oh, I've been saved. Woo! Well, wait till you're 85 years old, 90, all right? Last breath, have I been saved, right? You're one, you're, have, has your body been saved? God came to save us. He didn't create us to die. He created us to be immortal. So Jesus came to save us. So it says, who for the sake of mankind and for the sake of our salvation, or again, more English dynamic translation if you wanted, who for the sake of the salvation of mankind from death. Kat el thonta came down. Kat el thonta came down. Okay? Came down. Ek ton uranon. Out of the sky. Out of the sky. Or, again, now when I say sky, it's not the best translation either. Because when I say sky, you think of the blue little thing above you with some clouds and a, you know, and a bird flying through it. So it's, it, it doesn't help much. I like to use the word sky instead of the word heavens because it at least gets you a little closer to what they were thought in, the, in, the, in this period. But basically, a better translation it would just be too wordy. It would be the stuff above you, Okay who came down from the stuff above you, right? Who came down out of the sky or out of the heavens, if you like, or out of the stuff from above, right? Came down 
Kat el thonta ekton uranon came down out of the sky or out of the heavens, out of the silver. Ket sarcothenta and became flesh. Okay. All right. Now, how did he do, how did that happen? Well, look what it says. Ek pnevmatos agio, from the Holy Spirit, or by the Holy Spirit, out of the Holy Spirit, literally in the Greek there, out of the Holy Spirit. But in the English, it wouldn't work too well. So you'd say, by the Holy Spirit. How did, how did he who was from before all ages take on flesh for the salvation of mankind to save them from death? By the Holy Spirit. Ek pnevatos agiu. Ke pa marias tes parthenu. So, and Mary, the virgin. Okay, so by the Holy Spirit and Mary, the virgin. Again, jump in here if you have a comment or a question about as we're moving along through these lines while it's on your mind. Ke. En an santa and became man, became a human being, became human-like. Okay, theologians wouldn't like human being because they would know he's a divine being. Okay, fine, all right. But the, the problem is the language here. So, ke en an santa you can hear the word in there, and became man. Okay, became a member of humankind. How about that? We'll avoid the, uh, the theological problem of saying human being. So, and became uh, a, became mannish. There we go, that works. Became mannish or humanish. It doesn't, it doesn't really work too well in the English. I'm sorry, I'm trying to, trying to get this as best as we can right out of the Greek here. And became humanish. I just made a new word, I think. All right. Became humanish. Became man. Okay? You might say, well, he was a man, though, wasn't he? Not just, though, he wasn't a woman, he was a man. Yes, 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 of course he was. But that's not what the Greek is trying to say there. The Greek's not to say he became a man versus a woman. It's trying to say he became one of us. He became one of us. That's what it's trying to say, because he's trying to save us. And again, this is why I, I want to pull my hair out when I hear sometimes people arguing about this stuff at coffee socials. You know, how should it be translated? Well, my, that translation says humankind. Oh, that's heresy. It should say man. Oh, my goodness. Oh. All right. Um, let's see. Next line. Okay, so look at the flow of this thing. This is so theologically rich, right? He became man. Why? to save us. This is still one sentence, by the way. We haven't taken a breath. I mean, there's no periods here. Greek loves to do this. I think German does it too. If you know, you know German, they like these long sentences, but Greek loves this. Okay, there's a, I remember reading the epistle to the Hebrews one time. I almost lost my breath trying to read this thing. It went on for half a page of Greek. It was just one sentence. I don't know, like chapter six or seven or something. All right. Okay. Stavrothenta te iper imon. So who was who was crucified for us? Epi pontiu pilatu. That's an addition from Constantinople. In the, in the Nicene Creed, they just said who was crucified, who died for us, but. They want to get a little more, that stage, they're a little more interested in historical precision. So they added the, the, the name Pontius Pilate there. Father? Yes. I was wondering if you could tell me what uh, 
uh, Staru uh, uh, O. Stavro Thirta, who was crucified? Who was crucified? K is four. Uh, oh, that's what? right, Bob. You remember your Greek. You had some Greek with me. That's right. So, te, so, also. Okay. Also. So, who was crucified also for our sake? So, te is basically, it's, te is just like and, ke. But they'll use it to mean and, or in, in the, whenever it follows like this, it means also in English, if you want to translate it. So, it would be, yeah. Who was born, uh, who was uh, born of the, became flesh of the Holy Spirit of Mary, the Virgin, and who became man. Imon is us, right? Crucified also. So he didn't just, he wasn't just born for our sake. He was crucified for our sake. So he was born and he was crucified. You see that? So he was born for our sake and he was crucified for our sake. Right? Obviously, he couldn't be crucified. He couldn't die until he had been born. Right? So he's born for our sake. He became flesh for our sake so that he could die for our sake. Right? We who need to be saved from death. Right? So he's died. So, yes, Bob. Uper, Imon uh, is, uh, I don't know what Uper is. Uper, for the sake of. Or for, simply here. And then Imon is all? Us. Us. Okay, so Stavrothenta, so who was crucified, Te also. Ben, for the sake of, Imon, us. Epi, Pontiu Palato, so by Pontius Pilate. Okay? I just hit you on mute there, Bob, because you've got some background noise there. Who was crucified for us? Uh, and then we'll show it by Pontius Pilate. Okay? And that's not the end of the story. That's not all. And that's where a lot of theologians would like to end right there. And he died for us. He was crucified for us, you see. There's more to it. That's not the end of the story. Ke pathonta and died, died, and tafenta, tafenta, and was buried. These are all participles, by the way. Who, uh, and who died, if you want to really get the participial sense here, and who died, and who was buried. Who was buried? Tafenta. You guys remember in our church we have the taf uh, the tafio service, right? So there's that word there, the burial, right? All right, and then ke anastanta and who rose, right? And who rose, so who, and who died, and who was buried, and who rose, there's that word, anastanta, right? And who rose, te trite emera, on the third day. Katas, tas, grafos, according to the scriptures. Now, there is a really interesting exegetical question there. Which scriptures, what are they talking about? Are they talking about the resurrection narratives? Certainly. But what's really interesting is if you get into the Gospels, They'll talk about Jesus rising from the dead according to the scriptures. What? Well, wait a minute. You can't have what, – what scriptures are they referring to? Right? Right? Prophecy. So let me give an example of this. This is in, um, in Acts uh, 
So, um, what we got according to the scriptures that was in, oh, I can't remember which reference in the, in the Gospels. But anyway, according to the scriptures, they're most likely referring to, when you see that in the, in the New Testament, they're most likely referring to the scriptures, right? The scriptures of the Old Testament. You're not going to find the scriptures used in the New Testament, I mean the scriptures. So when they say the scriptures in the New Testament, they're talking about the scriptures of the Old Testament. They say, well, well, where is the prophecy of the resurrection of the dead, of Jesus, in the scriptures of Israel? To what are the New Testament authors referring? Well, most likely, if you look at Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, Peter quotes Psalm 16, right? It says, For thou wilt not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let thy holy one see corruption. And you see Paul quote that psalm later on as a reference to the resurrection of Jesus. So it's probably the Old Testament reference or the scriptures to which they were referring, Psalm 16. If you look at the New Testament, you can... It's just a handful of scriptures that they'll quote over and over and over again in reference to Jesus. Think of Deuteronomy 18.15, right? A prophet like me shall arise. They see that as fulfilled in Jesus, right? Not Joshua, the Old Testament, the Joshua, the New. Uh, Abraham's promise, the promise to Abraham, that through his seed all the nations shall be blessed. You see it all over the New Testament. Uh Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, and then Psalm 16. Two others like that. Okay, so uh, we're out of time here. I better keep going. All right, according to the scriptures. So according to the scriptures, Psalm 16 might be in their mind there in the background, but obviously the resurrection narratives are well known from the Gospels by this time when this is being composed. Ke an el thonta is tus uranus, and who ascended, who went up. So look at this. You had um, you had earlier who came down. We had it up here. Kat el thonta ek ton uranon, who came down out of heaven. Now you have an el thonta, the opposite. He went up, right? So and went up. Ascended, we say in English, but I'll just keep it there. It's kind of the, the simple wording there. And who went up into the sky or heavens or stuff above us. Now we want to translate. And kathezomenon. And who is seated? And he who is seated. Or and who sits, and who who sits or is seated. Ek, English Ek dexion tu petros from the right side, from the right side, or in English, better just simply at the right side. Of the Father. Dexion tu Petros. <clears throat> then, Ke Palin and Echomenon. So I'm trying to keep the lines there so you can see them. Ke, so and, Palin and Again, Erchomenon. Erchomenon is coming. Right? Look at that. It's beautiful. Not shall come, but is coming. You get that intensity in the in the Greek present tense there. And who is coming? He's on his way right now. Very, very intense. And again is coming. Erchomenon, meta doxes, with glory. So with glory, or power, but glory, 
glorious power would be maybe a good English translation to get the sense of there, but with glory, krine zontas, to judge the living. Ke nekrus, and the dead. To judge. So why is he coming back? To judge the living and the dead. Well, they can't be judged unless they've been raised, right? So obviously, you know, the resurrection's coming. When he returns, he raises the dead, then you have the judgment. You see this in the end of the book of Revelation. All right, so, And again, is coming with glory to judge the living and the dead. Utes vasilias. Vasilias. Basilias. Basil. There's that word. You know that word. Right? Kingship, right? And of whose kingdom, of whose kingdom, uk estetelos shall not end. Okay? Okay, next line there. We're almost at the end here. So now we're in our new, next section, but it's still one sentence. And we're not done yet. And so now they're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And and in the Holy Spirit. What do you mean in? Well, we believe in, right? So and in the Holy Spirit. This is one verb. There's only one finite verb here in the whole sentence. It was at the beginning. Pnev, uh, 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 pistevo, okay? Pistevo, I believe. Pistevomen, in the plural. We believe. That's one verb upon which is hanging this entire structure. Okay? I believe. And we're, this is all accused of us. Up to this point, we believe in this, 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 and in the Holy Spirit. So that the whole section about Jesus was that's anti Arian, and that's basically, for the most part, what you've got there, though in a slightly simpler form, comes from Nicaea. Though you get little extra little additions thrown in there, like Pontius Pilate and things, that comes from Constantinople. Okay, ke is to pnevma to agion, and in the Holy Spirit. So you have the Father, the Son, now the Holy Spirit, and in the Holy Spirit. English translations, because you get out of breath here, you lose your track, say, we believe, they start over again. We believe, they keep starting the sentence over again. But in the Greek, it's one big, long, flowing statement. And in the Holy Spirit, tokirion, the Lord, to zoopion, zoopion, the life maker, maker of life. To ek tu patros ek porevomenon, who, who, through, so who, from the holy, from the Father, ek porevomenon, comes out, goes out. I know there's prettier translations there, but I'm just going to do the what it says right there. Go, ek is out, and porevomenon, to go. And it goes out, proceeds, whatever you want. Okay? You may note that the uh, filioque is not here, and from the sun. That's a later addition in the Latin creed, but we don't have time to discuss it right now. To sin patri, who, with the father, que huio, and the son, sin proskunumenon, is worshipped. Is worshipped. Literally to bow down and kiss from the Greek there. Bow down and kiss, but it comes out in English to, to worship, with the sense of just falling down, kissing the feet of. Right? Who is worshipped. Ke sin doxazomenon. And glorified 
right? Who, with the Father and the Son, is together worshipped and together glorified. You have the sin, the sin with there, both of them. Okay. I'm trying to obviously emphasize the equality there. Okay, and then a little more about the Holy Spirit. Tolale son diato profeto. Who spoke? Who spoke through the prophets? Obviously, of the Old Testament. Who spoke through the prophets of the Old Testament? He spoke through the New too, but that's what they're talking about. Who spoke through the prophets? All right, now. That is, as far as I can see from the grammar, the end of the sentence, okay? <gasps> now you can breathe, okay? So you've got this whole beautiful, long Trinitarian statement. I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <sighs> this is probably when they yanked them out of that physical form. All right, so then, now there's a, something more. There's a fourth statement now. Or a, if you want it, really, we could say that was all one statement, a Trinitarian statement, and now there's a second statement which is attached to this. Ismian agian. Notice it doesn't say ke. If this, most translations would want you to have ke here in the English. And I believe in. That's not what it says. You don't get ke here. You got ke all the way along. If they wanted ke, they would have given it to you. Ismian. So this is a new statement being said as far as the Greek structure goes here. So I'll put an, another sentence here. Into one holy Catholic universal, right? Not based upon a particular nation. At this time, religions were national. Egyptians didn't worship Philistine gods. Philistines didn't worship Roman gods. And if a Roman god, if Romans wanted to worship Greek gods, they renamed them, right? You had your own personal gods, okay? You don't mix them up. And so what was unique about the Christian faith, it was labeled very early on. The first use of it that we have in writing was in St. Ignatius of Antioch, who referred to the Catholic Church, the universal gathering of God's people not simply from one nation or another, into one holy, non-national, would be the sense of Catholic there, non-national, uh, which again was very strange in that period. This is what made Christianity distinct from all the religions. It was non-national, ear-national. Okay, so anyway, into one holy Catholic and apostolic. Now, do you think they were worried about apostolic secession back then? No. They knew who they were, who, who did. They could recite. Any guy in that period could recite who ordained the guy before him and who ordained him. They'd love, they, it wouldn't take very long. It's just a few generations. But that's how we usually hear it today. We hear it as an apologetic against Protestantism, which is not apostolic. Right? But that's not what they're saying. There's no... Lutherans running around at that time, apostolic, meaning we've inherited it from the apostles. Traditional would be another word, apostolically traditional, okay? Apostolic, the, the faith we have is apostolic. That's what I'm trying to say. All right, so in one holy cap and apostolic, church, church. What is church there? Church is actually a funny word here. Church is an English word that comes from the old German, kirke, which comes from the Greek, kiriake, which is a possessive adjective. His, the Lord's something, the Lord's something. What Lord's? The Lord's church, ecclesia, so, or ecclesia. So the full phrase would be kiriake ecclesia. The Lord's ecclesia is gathering. The Lord's congregation. The Lord's gathering. His own people. His nation. Okay. But here, often as we get, ecclesion is a word that gets used to, uh, gets translated or transliterated in a certain sense, circumlocated with church. But anyway, church gets you the sense of apostolic church, gathering, okay? Congregation. Let's go with the literal words here. Uh, congregation is the Latin equivalent of ecclesia. 
It's the exact Latin equivalent, basically. Congregation. Congregation. Gathering. So apostolic gathering. Okay, I will leave it at that for sake of the sense of it here. Okay, so this is one sentence now. Into one holy Catholic and apostolic gathering, homologo, I profess, I profess, en baptisma, one baptism. This is coming right out of uh, Acts chapter 2, right? Uh, what should we do, brothers? Be baptized for forgiveness of your sins. I profess one baptism, is athesim amartion, for the forgiveness of sin. That's right out of Peter's words from Acts 2. I profess one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. Sins, literally, here. Sins. Okay. Uh, sins, mistakes, mis, uh, you know, misfires. <laughs> Not doing it the right way. Uh, and then proskodo, okay, so this is, this is another statement now. So there's two sentences, a sentence there. Into one holy catnapsal gathering, church, I profess one did, baptism for forgiveness of sins. And then a final statement. I expect prosdoko. I expect anastasin necron. I expect one, I expect the resurrection from the dead. There's no articles there if you want to get, I expect resurrection from the dead. So we get real Greeky sounding. I expect resurrection from dead, from, from necron, from those who are dead, from, from those who are dead. I expect resurrection from those who are dead. All right. And then finally, last statement. That's not just it. Ke zoen. Why would you be raised from the dead? And zoen. Ke zoen. And life. Life to melontos, which is coming. And life which is coming. Eonos. Eonos, and life which is coming in eternity, the eternal life, and life eternal, right? And life which is coming, uh, in, in English, I say life which is coming uh, eternal, or and eternal. I threw in the and there because it just wouldn't come out in the English words. And eternal, and then finally, Amen. I believe it. Absolutely. Okay. So what's really interesting here is I'd like you to take away from this is a couple of main points here. First of all, you have a beautiful structure of salvation history here. You have the creation. You have the incarnation, the second creation, right? The first creation. And then you have the second creation, as John shows us in the prologue, right? So the incarnation is the new Adam. The second creation jumps right up to that and it gives you a full description because of what Arius was saying and what that means. Why did he come? To save us from death. And how did that happen? He became flesh and then he died for us and then he rose on the third day. Right? And then, then when it's all this, this says, and the Holy Spirit, who is the maker of life? All the beautiful imagery again of the Holy Spirit. You think of the Holy Spirit all the way back there from the beginning, hovering over the, the waters of creation. And then, and then finally, and then it ends, and then it says this new statement here. Into one holy Catholic apostolic gathering, the church there, gathering, ecclesia, I profess one baptism. For the forgiveness of sins. You see the relationship of those that statement, how it works. So based on all this information of what God has done, here's what I do. Into one holy cat and apostolic gathering, I profess one baptism. You can see this is Pauline language here. Paul talks about being baptized into Christ, Galatians 3:27. And those who are baptized into Christ, is 
Christon are then en Christo, are in Christ. So I profess in, into one holy capnostal church, in two, notice the in two. Most English translations will not give you in two. They'll say in, because they want to say, I believe in. No, you don't believe in. You believe in God. You don't believe in, you, but you are, I profess, I profess into one holy Catholic Apostolic Church, I profess one baptism. That's, that's sacramental baptismal language. You, you can feel the baptismal font and the whole liturgy right there, the person going through the baptismal font. For the forgiveness of sins, that's Acts chapter 2. And then one final statement. Why does it say it like this? Because it wants to make sure you understand the parallelism. I profess one baptism for forgiveness of sins. Why? Because sin brings death. Look at this parallelism here. Baptism, resurrection. You see the parallelism? Baptism, resurrection, sin, dead. Right? As St. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, sin brought death into the world. Right? Death, death, sin is your enemy because it kills you. Right? So I pronounce one baptism for the gifts of sin so that there can be a resurrection from the dead. It's beautiful. It's poetry. And then, therefore, I expect, I also look forward to, the life which is coming in eternity or eternal life. However you want to put it there in the English. And then finally, Amen.